Good morning, Faith Family. I hope that you are doing well. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those out and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to look at multiple verses of Scripture this morning, um, but the one we'll primarily focus on toward the middle uh, to the end of the sermon is 1 Corinthians 13, as we will pull out some great truths that we all need to hear, especially in today's time. So go ahead and turn your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 13. While you're turning there, the uh, title of the sermon is Loving Others is hard. Loving others is hard. And uh, that's just the fact, right? It's hard to truly love others. And that's what God commands us to do as Christians. He commands us to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. Uh, and he commands us to love our neighbor as ourself. In reality, loving God and loving others is the chief attribute of Christianity, of Christians. It should be um, our most a defining attribute in our life is love. Listen to what the Word of God says in 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Now listen to this. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, Scripture can't be any more clear than it is right here that we as Christians, if we know God, we are to love. If we don't know God, then we won't know how to love. If we don't love, it shows that we don't know God. Now, I want to transition now. And in, in saying that that is our chief attribute of Christians, I want to transition now to just what's been going on these last several weeks in the world. As I have prayed through this and processed through this and read Christian leaders as they have spoken on this, I have found that my head has just been swimming. It's been swimming with different thoughts and different emotions and different things that I have been praying through, things we've been talking to the staff about. And I have found myself longing to be at a place of godly thought and godly wisdom. I have found myself longing uh, to be at a place uh, where there is no more biased opinion, where there is no more racism, where there is no more sexism, where there is no more children starving to death, where there is um, no more sex trafficking. I've longed to be at that place. And as I've processed through that and, and looking at the sins that this world is in, um, I found myself longing to be in heaven. Longing to be at a place where there is no more arguments and no more fights and no more um, racism or sexism or uh, biased thought. Like I, I have longed to be at a place where, where there's perfect reconciliation. I've longed to be at a place where there is no more sickness and no more disease and no more pain, no more children suffering. I've longed to be there. But as I've processed through that with my head swimming, the fact of the matter is I'm not there yet. I'm not there. And I am a sinner saved by the grace of God who lives with depraved people in a depraved world. And as I have processed through that, um, again, I've had different thoughts and different emotions. And I have watched other people have the responses and sadly, I must say that I've seen a lot of poor responses, especially out of Christians. I've seen uh, people over-emotional. I've seen people unloving. Um, and I've began asking myself uh, what a Christian response should look like. What should we and how should we as Christians respond uh, in this depraved world with all that's going on? Um, and I've kind of landed at a few different spots and some spots I want to share with you this morning as I was processing through that and uh, just seeing all that's going on in the world, longing to be at heaven, but realizing uh, that we as depraved people have to live in this depraved will and world until God calls us home. Then processing and saying, man, we have to respond as Christians in a way that shows love. And what is that? Um, I, again, started just jotting some things down, started just uh, writing some things and thinking through a few different things. And the first thing that I wrote down is uh, I asked myself, who are the people uh, that God has called me to influence? Who are the people that God has called me to lead? And as I began writing uh, and jotting things down, I found that there's only a select group of people 
that God has called me to lead and have influence over and that I need to be faithful in that. The first is my family. Right? God has called me to be uh, faithful in how I lead my family for the glory of God. God has also called me to be the lead pastor here at New Union. And so God has given me um, a few, several hundred people here um, to shepherd and to lead and to love and influence for the glory of God. And then if I make the bullseye a little bit bigger, um, God has called me to influence this community for the glory of God. That he sovereignly uh, placed me in Ray County uh, to influence this community for the glory of God and to lead lost people to him. And so as I began processing through that and my head swimming with all the different things that are going on in this world and trying to pray and process through that, I really found myself more grounded thinking and asking God the question, who have you called me to influence for your glory? Who have you called me to lead for your glory? And as I began to write that down, it really um, put my mind at rest. It really targeted how my uh, leadership and who my leadership should go to and how it should be to those people that God has called me to lead, like my wife and my children, my family, my church family, my community. And so as I began, I thought to myself, man, what, um, what does my family and my church family, my community, what do they need to hear from me? What do they need to hear from me during this um, rough time that we're in um, just with all that's going on in 2020 and the first truth that I need you guys to hear is this truth number one God's word guides us and is our authority if I could lead you and influence you uh, that would be my truth number one that God's word guides us and is our authority not the news it's God's word not our own opinion, not our own emotion, not our own thought. Our hearts are wicked. And some people say, well, I know in my heart what is right. Well, your heart is wicked. It tells us that in the word of God, in Jeremiah, that, that our hearts are wicked and sinful. And so the first truth I need you to grab is God's word guides us. And it should guide you and it should guide your thoughts and it should guide your emotion and it should guide your response to this world. The second truth is this. Jesus is who we devote our lives to as he is our Lord, master, and greatest treasure. He is who we devote our lives to. He is who we proclaim. He is who we cling to. He is who we submit to and we seek to live our life to glorify him. Truth number three, the gospel is the Great Commission and our mission in this life. The gospel is the Great Commission and our mission in this life. Truth number four, God is just and we should reflect his justness. I need you to hear that this morning. God is just and we should reflect his justness. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Hear that. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Let me read that last little bit to you again, church family. To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. God. Fifth truth I want you to grab hold of as I was just jotting things down is this. We are called to love God and love others. So yes, the word of God is our authority. Yes, we devote our life to Jesus. Yes, we go out and proclaim the gospel as that is our mission for life. Yes, we are to reflect justness because God is just and we are to love God and love others. It's what we're called to do. Matthew 22, 36 through 39 says this. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart 
and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Like let that sink in. What about Romans 12, 14? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. What about 1 Peter 1, 22? Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. What about Luke 6, 27 through 36? But I say to you, who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other one also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Listen to verse 32. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. Verse 35, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Jesus showed us this. He showed us this type of love and he expects us to reflect this type of love, to race after it and chase after it for his glory. Even as wicked and depraved people, we are to kill sin and love God and love others. But Jesus showed us this, didn't he? Look at, look at John 13, two through five. During supper, when the devil had already put it in his heart of Judas to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He lay aside, he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. You see this? God served and loved the disciples, even disciples who were going to betray him and deny him. What about, what about Romans 5a? But God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ moves towards sinners in love, not away from them. God moves towards sinners in love, not away from him. Now, church, this is hard. Loving others is hard. It is it's hard to love others. It's hard to serve others. It's hard to love those who persecute you and do good to those who, uh, who, who treat you poorly and abuse you and curse you. It's hard to love others earnestly from a pure heart. It's hard to bless them and not curse them, those who persecute you. But God shows us this and he calls us to do the same. So how do we show love? Are we showing love, church family? I need you to ask yourself those questions. Are you showing love and how do you show love? How do you do it? Again, as my head has been swimming these last several weeks, it is shocking to me that so many had such a quick response to all that's going on in this world. Such a quick response. It makes me wonder if they ask themselves, if they ask themselves this question, are they showing love? It makes me wonder if they truly prayed about it and reflected on it and processed it. Now, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, so don't hear me say that. I'm just telling you over the last several weeks, 
Um, there's things that has bothered me and disgusted me and things that have burdened me and things that I have prayed through and processed with our other elders. And, and I'm just shocked at the people who can respond so quickly. And then to respond as Christians in a way that goes against those verses that I just read you burdens my heart. call ourselves Christians and to operate in a way that is unloving is sinful and not of God. It's sinful and not of God. 1 John 4, 7 through 8 tells us that. And so this morning, I need you um, to ask yourself how you are showing love. I need you to ask yourself, ask the Holy Spirit to, to, to pull any bias in any any um, sin in your heart out and kill it so that you can glorify God as a depraved person who lived in a depraved world. I need you to ask yourself that question because if we are ever going to get through this, this time we are in, it's going to come through people putting everything on the table, putting everything out there, truly valuing life, loving others, talking Truth, looking to the word and being able to pray and, to, tr and to, to love one another for the glory of God. Well, I told you um, that the sermon's really going to come from 1 Corinthians 13. And I think it's a really good verse of scripture for us to hear. This verse of scripture uh, starts off with talking about people speaking in tongues. And uh, what Paul is teaching them, he is saying that church and Christianity is not about showy gifts. It's not about even um, having prophetic powers. Uh, but it is about love. It says this in verse 3, if I give all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. And so we as Christians in church is not about showing gifts. It's not about prophetic power. It's about love. It's about sacrificially, unbiasedly, humbly loving one another for the glory of God and loving God um, devotely, devoutly in all devotion. And so listen to what 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through um, really the first part of verse 8. Listen, listen to what the Word of God tells us. Love is patient. Love is patient. And again, I told you the title of the sermon is, the sermon is love, uh, loving others is hard. And it is. Why? Because this is what love is. Love is Patient. Patient means bearing with a person's worst behavior. Hear that. Love is patient. Bearing with a person's worst behavior without retaliation, regardless of circumstance. Now I know some of you that has really bothered this morning that I just said that. Because you are sinful to your core. You can't imagine not retaliating. I'm asking you to repent of that. That, that Jesus doesn't retaliate when he rescued us. He loved us patiently. So love is patient, bearing with a person's worst behavior without retaliation, regardless of circumstance. Love is kind. So love is patient and kind. Kind diligently seeking ways to be actively useful in a person's life. Man, I, you know, I, I wish that with all this going on in the world that, that I could put that out there somewhere and, and it actually help people. You see, what, what, do you, what do you mean, Pastor? Like we have social media for that, right? Uh, you can make up a little meme or something and you can post it on social media and people can share it. Listen, social media is just a firestorm of emotion. 
There's nothing getting accomplished through that. We want to act like that's the public square, but reality is nobody goes in there to change opinion. They go in there to argue, and they go there to fight, and they go there to fuss, and they go there to give their opinion, thinking that they actually have influence over people. And reality is I'm not going to um, be naive enough to think that I have influence over all my friends on my Facebook page. I know who I have influence over, who God has given me influence over to lead, and I'm going to make sure I lead them well and not start just another firestorm on social media because that's what it is, um, just a firestorm of emotion. And so love is kind. I want to ask myself, how can I diligently, diligently seek ways to be actively useful in a person's life? Useful. Continue on. Love does not envy. Love does not envy. A person who envies, right? Um, a person who is envious is not of God. Love does not envy means a person should delight in the honor given to someone else. And so, listen to what the first three have told us in this description of love. Love bears with a person's worst behavior. This love is kind and it diligently seeks ways to be useful in a person's life. And it does not envy. It, does, it, it delights in showing honor given to someone else. Man, I can't wait for heaven, can you? I wish this was true of us now. I wish. Love does not envy. It does not boast. I mean, drawing attention to oneself exclusion of others. We're not supposed to be that. We don't, we don't boast. We're not envious. Continue on. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. Arrogant. Thinking you are more important than others. Thinking you are more important than others. It is not rude. It means not engaging in ungodly activity. Love does not insist on its own way, believing that it's your way or the highway. Love is not irritable, not resorting to anger as a solution to difficulties, not resorting to anger. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, never delighting in a person's unrighteous behavior. Listen to what it says in verse 6. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love is patient and kind. It's not envious. It's not boastful. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable, but rejoices with truth. Rejoices with the things of God the word of God, the character of God. Verse seven, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Let's go back. Love bears all things. Being publicly silent about another's faults. That's the definition of that. Love bears all things. Being publicly, hear this, publicly silent about another's faults. I haven't seen that from Christians over the last several weeks. And if love is what our key attribute, defining attribute should be, then some and a lot are not doing this. So love bears all things being publicly silent. Love believes all things, expressing confidence in others. Have we expressed confidence in others? Love hopes all things, expecting future victory in another's life. Love endures all things, outlasting every assault of Satan to break up relationships. So love is 
bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Church family, we as Christians have to be grounded in this. Like we are called, our most defining attribute, we are called to love God and to love others. And I need you to really ground yourself with that love and ask God to help you in this trying time we're in to reflect Christ well because he has saved you and redeemed you. We live as sinners in a sinful world. But even so, we are called to love God and love others. You may be asking this morning, well, what's your point of view, Pastor? What, what do you think? What's, what's your thoughts? I don't need to give you my thoughts. I need to influence you to love. I need you to ask God how to love how to be grounded in truth, how to love others the way that you'd want to be loved and treat others the way you'd want to be treated. They should see a difference in us as Christians. We should not look the same. We should not look the same in our speech or action. We should look different because of God's grace and mercy toward us, because of how he has shown us what true love looks like. So how should you show others love, maybe even others who sin against you, maybe maybe others who disagree with you or have different thoughts than you. Well, one way you can pray, you can actually pray for them. Not pray biasly, but, but pray for them. Pray that you will be one who bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. You can pray. Number two, you can listen humbly. Just because someone disagrees with you or has different thoughts from you, it's okay to be humble. It's okay to listen humbly and even respond humbly. It's okay. Third thing you can do is you can stand firm on the word and nothing else. Stand firm on the word and nothing else. The fourth thing you can do is you can value others as image bearers. So what do you mean by that, Pastor? That we as people were all created in the image of God for the glory of God. Every one of us. We should value one another. We are all created in the image of God. And so we should value that because we value life. So when you value the person, that's, that's what makes it hard on social media, right? It's just something you could type and whatever. Do you value the person you're saying that to? Do you truly value them? Are you standing on the word of God? Are you listening humbly? Are you praying for them and caring for them and seeking to love them? And then number five, what you can do is what Micah 6 eight tells us, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Church family, when you love someone, you, um, you don't love past them, around them, or above them. You just love them. When you love someone, you don't love past them, around them, above them, parts of them. You just love them. And we are called to love God and to love others. So church family, Love people well. I know it's hard. I know that it's hard. And I know that um, 2020 is hard. I hope that it's a year that even though it's hard and loving others is hard, that is a year of spiritual growth for you and for us. That we really cling to God and hold tightly to God and kill sin and promote his love to this lost and hopeless and dying world. The fact is, this world doesn't have the answers how to fix um, what's all going on in this world. They don't. They have no hope and they have no answers. They only have anger and fussing and fighting. So that's how they do it. And that doesn't work. But we as Christians, we do have the answer. It's called the word of God. It's called loving other image bearers. It's called loving God, 
loving others, preaching the gospel, letting Jesus redeem people and change people, letting the old man die and the new man be raised to life uh, through Jesus and the Holy Spirit indwelling inside of them. We have the answers. So how about instead of uh, stirring up trouble, we point people to the one who has the answer and his name is Jesus. How about that? How about we love people well? How about we influence the people that God has put us to influence and lead and point them to the word of God for the glory of God? That's where I've landed, church. That God has called me to influence you and to point you to the, the word of God and to the love of God for the glory of God. And so I hope that you will influence the people that God has put you over the influence well for his glory. I hope that you will be people who love and seek the Lord and walk humbly and justly for the glory of God. May God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace.